Send your rain to your people. Send your rain, O Lord. Send your rain, O Lord. Send your rain. different. We're going to have a special collection for the power bill. <laughs> Actually, this morning we set this up intentionally to show the one true light of God, <laughs> the one emergency light that's working. Uh, the city has a problem. We've lost a phase. We don't have lights or heat, but we have sound and visuals. So given the four, I'll take those two. What can I say? If you're a guest with us, obviously it doesn't usually look like this. I mean, we're very appreciative to have you with us. We hope that everybody fills out a card in the pew in front of you and turns that into the collection plate later so that we can have a record of your attendance. This morning we focus on the will of God. And so I hope that you will be able to see God's will in all the songs and the scriptures and the things that we do. And I'd like to begin by asking you to stand if you would and join me in reading this prayer from Matthew 6. This then is how you should pray. Read with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And I said, it's all right, 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 it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. don't all you know right. that it's just, just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Do you believe it's all right, 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 don't you know that it's just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Talk with Jesus made me 
it's all right. 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 It's
is that I didn't want to hurt my mom's feelings. I was such a tender-hearted child. That is where my prayer life began. And for most of us, it is probably pretty similar to the start of your communication with God. And what a powerful way for me to start my prayers as a child as I thanked God for the people who were closest and most special to me. But I wonder, when did my thoughts on prayer begin to evolve? When did it stop becoming something that I did with my mom and dad at night and become something that I did that brought me into the presence of God, building and strengthening a deeper relationship with the one who created me, allowing me to become one with him? It's hard for me to say, but I know for much of my life, and even still today, I must admit that my prayer life has been very self-fulfilling. What do I want in this life? I'll pray for it. Where do I want to be in 10 years? I'll pray about it and ask God to take me there. What do I want people to see when they look at me? I'll ask God to make me that person. I, 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 me, me, me. Is there anything wrong with praying for ourselves? Absolutely not. But what about when my prayer becomes all about me? I'm not sure that this is the kind of focus that God intended for us to have in our communication with him, nor is it what he intended when it becomes the focus of our lives. And our prayer is going to be directly affected by whatever our lives are focused on. This morning I want to talk about my will. I want to talk about God's will, and I want to talk about what happens when God's will becomes my will. I want to do that by looking at three different examples of prayer in the Gospels. Our first example comes from Luke 18, which was just read. Now, Jesus is telling the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, uh, speaking to those who are confident of their own righteousness, allowing them and causing them to look down on everyone else. The Pharisee's prayer is all about himself. He basically thanks God for himself. He thanks God that he is the way he is, and then he makes himself look good in front of everyone else by telling God about all the good stuff that he himself is doing for God. I think that you will agree with me that this example, the example of this Pharisee, very much points to a man whose focus is on his own will, my will, my agenda, I, 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 me, me, me. We can see something very wrong with this as he approaches the throne of God only to talk about himself. That is very easy to see, very plain to see. But in our own lives, it is not as easy for us to point out. That's because we often fail to see ourselves the way that everyone else sees us. And we see others in a way that allows us to think more highly of ourselves, just like the Pharisee. I'm not going to suggest that any of us pray like this Pharisee, although we do have tendencies to use prayer as one of our biggest forms of gossip. But easily one of our biggest struggles as human beings is giving up control and allowing what God wants for us to be our focus. And when I fail to let go, my life becomes all about my will. My will says it's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's all about my desires. My will is all about what the world tells me I need, and I will stop at nothing to obtain these things. My will asks others to serve me, even wanting others to look at me and give praise to my name for the things that I have done, including God. Look at me, God. See how good I look. See all these things that I've done for you. And in turn, we expect to be rewarded. Which is why we so often ask the question when an obstacle comes our way, what did I do to deserve this? As if we are entitled to smooth sailing because we have lived so righteously. Our will, my will, wants my life to be as easy as possible. My will also fails to recognize any problems in my life. What sin? Asks my will. My will knows nothing of grace and mercy because my will is not even humble enough to even need it, 
much less ask for it. The tax collector's prayer here in Luke 18 is completely foreign to my will. Finally, my will has already been rewarded in full. Because my will calls for others to notice me, to see me as I want them to see me. And that is all I'm going to receive for focusing on my will. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 1, as he talks about some different issues with spiritual disciplines, he says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when I give, when I pray, when I fast, when I do anything for the Lord, my will does it to be seen by others, to be recognized by men. And that is the only reward that my will will receive. May we all submit to God, humbling ourselves before him, and forfeiting whatever my will is. Our wonderful and everlasting Father, we come before you this morning realizing that we are not worthy to extol you as you're meant to be extolled and to be viewed by us. But Lord, we ask you to help us to get a more accurate glimpse of your glory in our service this morning. And as we mingle with your people, may we have a keen sense of your presence among us and realize that you are worthy to be praised. And help us, Lord, to do exactly that, and help us also to come to terms with the fact that we don't always do what we ought to do, that we make mistakes, that we sin individually, sometimes we sin as a whole church. And we are so grateful that you have provided forgiveness for us, that your grace has made it possible for us to be saved in spite of all the errors that we commit, and we love you so much because you first loved us. Lord, we are a congregation afflicted with pain. There are so many among us that have heavy hearts and weary bodies because of ailments and various various distresses that come upon us. And we pray, Lord, that you will take away those detriments to our happiness and well-being, and you will provide for us what we need. Lord, we live in a country that is stricken with many, many problems. And uh, especially during this election week, we pray that you will be the guide of our people, that we'll make choices that ought to be made, and that you'll be recognized in all that we do. Lord, we ask you to help us to understand your will. Uh, We sometimes... A falter when we come trying to come to terms with what you'd have us to do in specific situations. And so we ask you to give us guidance that we might have the fullness of wisdom and understanding so that we might apply your wishes to us as a people. And so that in the days ahead, in the selections that we have to make about our leadership and in the other projects we have to consider, that we'll make the right steps and that you'll be pleased in what we do. Lord, we give you thanks and ask your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please, as we take our offering this morning. Let your glory fall in this room. Let it go forth from here to the nations. Let your fragrance rest in this place. As we gather to seek your face, let your glory fall in this room. Let it go forth from here to the nations. Let your fragrance rest in this place. As we gather to seek your face. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Let your will be done. Let us see the honor. Let us see the honor. The glory of your Son. Let your kingdom come. 
kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Let your will be done. Let us see on earth. Let us see on earth the glory of your Son. Let your glory fall in this room. Let it go forth from here to the nations. Let your fragrance rest in this place as we gather to see your face. As we gather to see your face. We continue in John 17. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as, though, even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory that you have given me because you loved me through the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you've sent me. So if my will focuses on me, then in the same, will, same way, his will focuses on God. The good news is, for those of us who are living a self-focused life, chasing after our own wills, God has not, nor will he ever give up on us. His arms of love are just as wide open for us when we are walking a selfish life as they are when we are walking with Him. On the contrary, however, God will humble those who walk in pride, as we read at the end of verse 14 in Luke 18. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. King Nebuchadnezzar comes to my mind. A man who was all about himself. God used people in his life to open his eyes to see what he had been wanting him to see all along. That he, the Lord, is God and nothing else or nobody else is. And eventually Nebuchadnezzar saw it. Although it took knocking him off his Babylonian throne to live amongst the wild animals for him to see it. And even Nebuchadnezzar admits as we read in Daniel 4, 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. That is his will. That is God's will. To be known as Lord, to be recognized as God, for nothing else in this world to take away the throne that He desires to have on our hearts. And when my focus is on myself, when I live according to my will, guess what I'm not doing? Recognizing Him as God. This is what Jesus prays for in John 17. Jesus prays, I pray that all of them may be one. Father, just as You are in me and I am in You. He prays, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. He continues, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you have loved me before the creation of the world. And righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them. We know the Father because Christ knew the Father. 
We have seen the Father because Christ has seen the Father. And we love the Father because Christ loved the Father. Just as Jesus knows God as Father, he prays that we know him the same way. His will is that we know the Lord as God, knowing everything he gives us through Jesus Christ. By knowing God the way that Jesus does, we know of his goodness. We know of his love. We know of his gifts. We know of his grace and his mercy and his willingness to make us new through the sacrifices and and atonement made at the cross. We know of his desire to bring us into glory with him, which he does through sanctification. He is making us holy. And then, just as we know God the way that Jesus does, we make him known the way that Jesus does. The gifts we are given through Jesus, we give in turn to those around us. Love, grace, mercy, forgiveness, all that is made available to us through the cross is available for everyone around us as we make it known to them. And every bit of glory, every bit of praise, every bit of honor goes to the one who made us. His will for us as believers is that as Jesus knows the Father, we know the Father. And as we know the Father, we make him known to others. Do we know God in this way? Are we one with him just as Jesus is one with him? Let's stand for prayer again. God is good, amen? I've always wanted to say that. Would you bow with me? Dear Father, always near us, may your name be treasured and loved. May your rule be completed in us. May your will be done here on earth in just the way it is done in heaven. Give us today the things we need today and forgive us our sins and impositions on you as we are forgiving all who in any way offend us. Please don't put us through trials, but deliver us from everything bad, because you are the one in charge, and you have all the power, and all the glory too is yours forever, which is just the way we want it. Amen. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. In the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own grief, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my soul shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful. Is my Savior's love for me. Be seated. And from the verse of the song, we continue in the garden in Matthew 26. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. 
Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, here comes my betrayer. So we've talked about my will, talked about his will. What happens when his will becomes my will? Well, I would call that our will. Because what he wants for me, I now want for myself. So we are in conjunction with one another, and therefore his will is now our will. So what does this look like for us? I think that we would all agree It is not always easy to allow God's will to become our will. God's plans are not always easily understood. But, even if we don't understand God's plan, we need to respond to His direction. Rick Warren writes, when we don't understand God's plan, it is even more important to do exactly what He directs us to do. Often, God asks us to make the choice to do His will before we know the specific details of his plan. And that's because part of God's plan is to develop in us a trust of his character and his benevolence. That's where it becomes so difficult, though, for God's will to become our will. We want to know beforehand what his will is, what his plan is going to look like. We don't like uncertainty. We don't like surprises. But if we knew what was going to happen, our trust in Him would be completely conditional. If God said, this is my will for you, that you do X and Y will join you, and therefore Z is going to happen, then we would have the power to say yes or no based on our opinion of what His will is. This is so hard for us because we do not like to give up control. My will always sounds so much better. So in allowing His will to become my will, I've got to trust His will. That is why His will is for me to know Him the way that Jesus knows Him. If I am one with the Father the way that Jesus is one with the Father, then my trust in the Father is going to be unwavering, completely unconditional, allowing me to follow Him wherever He leads me, no matter where, no matter when, no matter what, no matter the cost completely and unconditionally trusting in Him. We see no better example of this trust than in what was just read in Matthew 26. Jesus is praying in the garden just before He is arrested and sentenced to death. My Father, He prays, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as You will. He prays this a second time and a third time. Jesus, being fully human, was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Through his communion with the Father and by the power of the Holy Spirit living in him, Jesus felt the pain of what was to come. He had predicted his death already and it was his time to leave this world and the people that he loved most. Jesus the Son, again being fully human, had his own will. My will, we'll call it, was for this cup to be taken from him because of how difficult this cup was going to be. God, the Father, had his will. And that was for his son to be a sacrifice for the entire world, to save the world from their sins so that we may be with him. What we see here in Matthew 26 is God's will 
becoming Jesus' will because of the trust that Jesus had in the Father as God. Even when Jesus as a man couldn't fully understand the will of the Father and even asked if that will could be changed, he still had no doubt that his Father knew exactly what he was doing. His trust in the Father was unwavering and unconditional. Do we trust in our Father God in this way? On Monday nights, Jesse and I have several senior high teens that come to our house for a Bible study. Uh, This semester we're going through a book titled The Good and Beautiful God by James Bryant Smith, a book that I would recommend for all of you um, who want to dive deeper into your relationship with Jesus because this is exactly uh, what Smith's goal is for us as readers. He goes chapter by chapter looking at different characteristics of God um, and we seek to dive deeper into a relationship with God, the God that Jesus knows. The third chapter is titled, God is Trustworthy. And in it, he tells a story of him and his son that paints a great picture of how our relationship with the Father and the trust that we have in him should look. He says this, When my son Jacob was six years old, I took him to an amusement park. There were only a few people in the park that day, so we went from ride to ride without having to wait. We came upon a ride that I had never ridden before, but I assumed was fun. After all, we were in an amusement park. We got in our seats, and a teenage boy buckled us in. Soon the ride started whirling and spinning us faster and faster, jerking us around and up and down. I held on to Jacob as hard as I could, afraid that he would fly out of his seat. With white knuckles and gritted teeth, I prayed the entire 90 seconds for the ride to end. I looked over at Jacob, who was laughing and having a great time. When we got off the ride, I saw the name of it in bright red paint, the Scrambler, which was appropriate. Jacob said, that was fun, let's do it again. I said no. What I felt like saying was, not a chance, ever again. I am the worst father ever, please forgive me. We sat down on a nearby park bench and I asked, weren't you scared? That ride was pretty wild. Why did you get on a ride like that? He answered with childlike honesty. Because you did, Dad. Right or wrong, that little guy trusted me. I was and am clearly not worthy of such trust. I love him and would do anything for him and I would never put him in harm's way intentionally, but I am a limited, finite ignorant human being. In his eyes, however, being with me meant he was completely safe. How willing are we to follow the God that we claim to trust? When his will becomes my will, making it our will, it means that I'm willing to follow God anywhere he goes. Wherever he might send me, I will go. Whatever he might have me do, I will do. Our ability to allow His will to become our will completely depends on just how much we trust our God. And so it is so vital to our faith that we know that God is trustworthy. When we doubt His will, we doubt His goodness. We start getting pictures in our minds of our fears and our failures and we aren't completely sure how everything is going to turn out. But the God that Jesus reveals, the God that Jesus knows, the God that Jesus is one with would never do anything to harm us. He has no evil intentions. He's completely good and with Him, just like the boy felt with his dad at the amusement park ride, we are completely safe. We will always be safe. But that still doesn't mean that things are always going to be easy. It doesn't mean this world is going to be a walk in the park. In God's goodness and trustworthiness, Jesus still went to the cross. What is different, though, is when his will becomes our will. We trust that everything he did for us on the cross is enough to overcome any pain or sorrow, grief or trial in this world. That is why God, that is why Jesus says to his disciples, in the face of being taken, from this world to find peace. He says, I've told you all of this so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. 
But don't forget the things I just told you. There is something better coming. There is much better life ahead. And therefore, he continues by saying, but take heart. I have overcome the world. When his will becomes my will, I trust in that without fail. I know that the God who made me, even when I cannot understand the direction He is taking me, even when I don't know what the outcome will be, He has overcome any kind of obstacle I may face. Because He is good. And therefore, His will is also good. Thank You, Lord, for the cross. Not my will, but Yours be done. May we follow that will every day, even if it leads to the cross. May we follow His will. And may we accept His will and celebrate it. And that is what we'll do now with this meal. Pray with me. Our Father God, not our will, but Yours be done. And we thank You that Your will is even made possible for us to accept because of the love that You showed on the cross because of the grace and mercy that You have poured on us through Jesus Christ our Lord. God, we accept those gifts. We praise You for those gifts. We praise You for making us holy through Jesus Christ. And Father, we uh, we rejoice in that now. We celebrate that now when we take this bread and we remember Jesus Christ. And in the way that He completely forfeited His own will. And allowed your will to be done. We love you, God. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Father, we love you, we worship and adore you, glorify thy name in all the earth, glorify thy name.
continue to pray with me. God, how sweet is the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. God, that covers over and completely obliterates all of our sins, leaving absolutely no record of them. God, we thank you. Uh, We thank you for that blood. And Jesus, we thank you uh, for accepting the cup that our Father God had set for you. As even as difficult as it was, we thank you for the sacrifice. And we rejoice that you are living for us now uh, and living in us now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything you have done and everything that you do, we remember as we take this cup. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus, we love you, we worship and adore you, glorify thy thy name in all the earth.
different feel, so reverent and holy with no lights on. Shelby, great job. If you keep it up, you may make full minister someday like me and Steve. <laughs> Excellent job, really. Appreciate it. Uh, these things as we close. Our annual prayer service is coming up on November the 7th. That's from noon until midnight. Prayer cards are available in all the lobbies, or you can email your request to the office. Once you've filled out your card, simply return it to one of the designated boxes or drop it by the office. Parents, there will be child care from 6 until 9 o'clock on that Friday night. So if you would like to come and pray and know that your kids will be well cared for, please uh, take advantage of that. There's a baby shower today for Chris and Brittany Hirschfield. That's from 1.30 to 3. It'll be down in the Mercy Building. Starting point class begins November the 16th and 23rd. If you've been visiting with us or interested in knowing more about our church or placing membership with us, this is a great chance for you to get to know about who we are and what we do. You can uh, see or email Steve Krigger uh, to let him know you're interested in that. Uh, very important. Um, we took a, a survey recently, which you're all well aware of, to kind of see where the church was on a number of different things. And in order to dispense the results of that survey, if you will, we will be hosting lunches in the fellowship hall on November the 16th and the 23rd after our worship service to present the results of that survey. Since we're providing lunch and child care, a reservation is required. To sign up, you can either call the church office, you can sign up in the adult ed lobby, or you can follow the link in your bulletin and sign up online. We're holding those to about 100, and if we need to schedule another one, we will, but uh, we'll do about 100 at each of those, and then we'll see where we need to go from there. Very exciting news. The new directory is already back. It is downstairs in the fellowship hall, and you can go down on the table set up and find yours. They're in alphabetical order, we hope. You may also have a hole or a ditch or a place somewhere around your house or yard that could use some fill. If that's the case, I have about nine yards of dirt sitting in the corner of the parking lot from the new structure for the playground, and I would love to get rid of it. So you can feel free to come and pick up as much dirt as you would like, uh, anytime you would like, and have that around your house if you would like. Um, lastly, I want to invite Tom Brown up to make a quick reminder and announcement about our upcoming men's retreat. Tom? Oh my goodness. Good morning. As uh, a lot of you may know, I'm a, I'm a Civil War buff. I used to tell people I was a fan of the Civil War, but that never really get the message out that you wanted it. So, so why am I a Civil War buff? I'm a Civil War buff for a lot of different reasons, but if you had to boil it down to one sentence, I would tell you it is a wonderful opportunity to read about and learn about how ordinary men handle extraordinary circumstances, uh, which will change your life. So uh, something you also might know about me if you've been looking at Melissa's Facebook page is I have a dear, dear mother who will sew for me. So I have a complete Jeb Stewart dress uniform. And if any of you know anything about Jeb Stewart, he's, uh, he's very much a fan of pomp and circumstance. Um, so that means he's got a lot of ornate things on his uniform. Kids, future, or today language, that means there's a lot of bling on his uniform. So about two years ago, I'm giving a little talk uh, for my daughter's fourth grade class, and I'm in full uniform. Uh, and what I do when I give one of these talks is I just start at the hat, and I move down, and I talk to them about uh, what, what the hat's for, what it means, and, and how it relates to whatever um, they're doing right there. And for fourth graders, I had pretty good engagement and had some pretty decent questions. Until at one point in the conversation, I did that. And as I can see about right now, I had absolute attention. And I had eyes riveted on me from the rest of the time forward. So I'm hoping that that will hold true in this case as well. As you guys know, we've got a men's retreat coming up. Uh, and the Bible tells us <laughs> in uh, Proverbs 27, 17, that iron sharpens iron, so does one man does another. It also tells us in Ecclesiastes 10, 10, that if the ax is dull, the work is hard, but wisdom makes the work easy. So how I would like you to translate this today is, 
Men, we have to take the time to sharpen the ax. We have to take the time to learn how we will go through this world. If you come to the retreat, you're going to get the benefit of gentlemen who have lived it longer than us and are willing to share some of that wisdom with us. So please come and take that opportunity. One of the greatest tricks that the devil ever did was launch lies on us. So if you think you're ordinary men going through an ordinary life, I'm going to tell you you're wrong. We are at war every second of every day. So please take the advantage, take the time to know what these wise men have done for us and they can share with us and let us grow stronger together. Uh, it's actually going to have real beds, so there's none of that cabin stuff. Uh, and as the added benefit, if you'll come and see me right now down there, you get to look at the sword too. So <laughs> please come and talk to us. I'll go sign up right away. Hey, this morning, if you have a need for confession or for prayer, for reconciliation or for baptism, our shepherds will be right out these doors to my right. They would love to meet with you as we stand and sing this closing verse. Let's stand together, sing, and then we'll pray. Spirit, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify. been good to be here this morning. What a privilege we have to be able to gather together as a body of your children without fear of persecution. We're so thankful for the uh, message we heard, your message that we heard through Shelby. Thank you for the talent that you've given him. Help us, Father, to resolve to be more prayerful in our lives each day. Father, as we leave this assembly, we pray that you would bless us with strength to live the life that we are called to live, that we would keep our eyes focused on you, that we would keep your spirit in our heart, that we would keep your son by our side each day. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.